JungleBot's hand has one objective. Receive the ball and throw the ball. Despite only having one objective, it's probably the most important part of JungleBot in its entirety. And it's the part that has been giving me the most trouble since the beginning of this project. I've been putting it off for a little while and just kick the can down the road, but it's finally come time to actually solve the problem. And it's not an easy one. Before we jump into what my current solution is and why I'm making moves to change this solution, we need to understand what the actual objective of JungleBot's hand is. So just to recap, in case you haven't seen either of my first two videos, I'm working on making a juggling robot and I've broken this down into three components. There is the hand, which is the part that I'm working on now, the arm and the brain. The brain tells the arm and the hand what to do and where to move. The arm moves the hand into the correct spot at the correct time. And that was covered in my previous video. And the hand is the part that actually does the receiving of the ball and throwing it up again. So it's the only part that actually touches the ball during its flight. So that's the high level picture of what the hand needs to do. But before we can look at actual solutions, we need to try to understand the problem a little bit more. Because for example, do we want the ball to come in and just bounce off the hand? Because that's one option. Do we want the ball to be able to come in and be able to be held by the hand and then released at a specified time later on? And how do we want that path to look? We need to know these things before designing the actual hand component, because otherwise it's, it makes life a lot more difficult if you don't have a very clearly laid out problem. So for the hand, I do not want to have it just bounce off the hand because that to me, it really limits what, what the hand can do. If it can only, if it has no hold time, as I've been calling it, if you can just paddle it off. So that's one requirement that I've got. Another requirement is that the ball must follow a smooth path. This might not be very clear what I mean, but I mean that the ball has to come in and the hand will be able to receive the ball and catch it smoothly without the ball really changing speed much. It will go in smoothly and it will leave smoothly. This may seem like a pretty pedantic point to be fixing on, but this is very important and I'm willing to go to a fair bit of effort to make this happen. The reason for that is because if you've ever juggled yourself, you know that it's a whole lot easier when the ball follows a nice, smooth, controlled path. If it doesn't do that, and if it, as soon as it hits your hand in a hard way, it's going to jitter around and move. And with a robot, it has no way of sensing what those movements are. Once it goes into the hand, it doesn't know what's going on after that. It has to just trust that the ball is where it is. I could put some sensors in and have it figure out where the ball is with respect to the hand, allowing for those jiggles, but that's, that's not easy to do and I, I, I don't really want to go down that road. So I need the ball to go in smoothly and to leave smoothly. It's useful to note here that the other, the only other robot that is an example of an actual juggling robot, which is to say one that actually tracks the balls through the air and adapts to their positions, does not do this at all. I'm not too sure why the designers did this, but when the ball comes in, it catches and then it pauses for a second and then it throws it up again. And I'm willing to bet that that had something to do with the issues that they were having and why, why they made the pattern the way that they did. And that really restricted them. I do think they had some limitations with their actual robot design that forced them to do that. But thankfully, because I'm designing my robot just for juggling, I can work with this design requirement from the very beginning. So the ball needs to be able to be held and it needs to be caught and released in a smooth fashion. What have I actually done to achieve this? Well, here is my design. If you haven't seen my last video on JuggleBot's arm, this contraption probably looks quite confusing. And so I suggest watching that video now if you want to know what's going on with this green and blue part. That's, that's the arm. That has the, the objective of moving the hand around. The hand itself is constructed out of these three silver motors that are around on the green platform and the white uh, rings, I guess you could call them, and this orange part in the middle here. The way that this works is each of these three motors spins at the same time and rotates these rings up so that it pulls these cables tight. 
when they all when all three of these do this at the same time, this orange part is moved up and the ball is released. To keep all of the motors operating at the same time, the way that I've rigged this up is each of these motors has an encoder in it, which will keep track of how far the motor has moved since I started running it. And to get them all to sync up at the very beginning, I've attached little limit screws, limit switches in this edge here. So at the very beginning, when I start the program up, each of these rings will run until it hits that switch and then they'll all stop and they'll all be in sync. So this design works quite well, as you can see. It can throw the ball up to about half a meter or so, and that's decent. However, I am not super satisfied with decent. This design has quite a few issues with it, which I'll get to in a second. And because of those issues and the fact that it can only throw up about half a meter, I am going to scrap this and replace it for a design that I will get to at the end of this video. To give an idea of what I'm aiming for, for the ball throw height, I want to right now spec the juggerbot to be able to throw a five ball juggling pattern. And if it's throwing the same way that I throw, that requires throwing to about a meter high. So I need to get these to be a little bit better and it needs to throw a little bit higher. So what are the other problems with this? Well, we have the first one where it can only throw half a meter high with all of the motors at full power. Secondly, this design requires that all three of these motors work in perfect synchrony. Otherwise, this orange part is going to be pulling at weird angles and it's not going to throw nicely. Thirdly, it's pretty bulky and these cable pulleys, I guess you could call them, are quite large. Like they take up a decent amount of the total arm space. And to be honest, I, I don't really know if I like the way that they look. I, I don't know. It was a cool idea, but I don't think it looks as nice as it, cool, as it could. Obviously, looks is not a huge factor in my weighing up whether or not to change the design, but it's definitely something. <laughs> Another non-trivial issue with this is that the cables often slip off of these pulleys and they're pretty tedious to place back on. I do think it would be possible to fix this problem and to keep the cables in their tracks the whole time, but this combined with the other problems, it's just the cherry on top to make me not super satisfied with this design. It does work and it's quite nice to watch, but it could be a lot better. One other thing that I want to mention in case anyone watching is going down the process of picking out motors is that these motors don't start spinning until about 100 RPM or so. So once I've, once I've supplied about 40% of their maximum power, then they'll start spinning. And so I've been calling that a dead zone where it's just stopped and then nothing, 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 and then it'll start spinning. And that's way too high for me. I can't control this very precisely at all. If I want these motors to move just a little tiny bit, they can't do it. This is the first time I've bought DC motors like this. And to be honest, this is the first time I'm doing a lot of this stuff that I'm doing. And this came as a big surprise to me and I wasn't very happy with that. So I think that that's due to the fact that this is a brushed motor and has a lot of friction at the startup or otherwise known as stiction. Um, that combined with the fact that it's got a gearbox on it causes that problem to be even greater. So just a heads up that if you are looking for motors and you look for brushed motors, particularly with gearboxes, they may have a, a non-trivial dead zone where they just won't work. And so the slowest speed you'll be able to move them is still relatively fast. So that is where I'm currently up to with JuggleBot's hand. I went through quite a few different revisions and different approaches to this problem before arriving at this point. And if you're interested in that, then I'm happy to make a video about it. But for now, I'm trying to keep in the mindset of just moving forward. So I'm probably not going to do that unless there's interest. However, I do want to cover now what my updated design is for JuggleBot's hand. This one is fine, but my new one, I think it's pretty cool and I'm very keen to, to see how it works. So this is a drawing of my new design for JuggleBot's hand. 
this is a bit of a simplified drawing and even then it's a little bit tricky to understand. So I'm going to try my best to explain this and hopefully it gets across. To understand exactly what is going on here, it's worth going over exactly what each different part is. So the top green part is the platform and this can move around within six degrees of freedom with respect to the ground. This is the upper part of the arm that I covered in my last video. Keep in mind here that the legs and the base of this platform are not shown here because that would just make things a lot more confusing. Attached to the platform are these yellow smooth shafts and along those smooth shafts runs this blue carrier, I've been calling it. That carrier is what actually holds the ball. So the ball rests in the little cuff part in here, similarly to how it does in my current design with the orange cuff part. And this is ultimately what is throwing the ball. The way that it does that is that it is attached via these cables up over a pulley and down onto the ground. What happens here is that when the platform moves up, the length between this pulley and the ground is increased. So you see here, as this moves up, this length is increased. And what that means is this length in here is decreased. So what this means is that the carrier down here moves up towards the platform, as well as the platform itself moving up relative to the ground. So with this current setup, if the platform moves perfectly straight up, the carrier, and thus the ball, will move up at double the speed of the platform. So if that's V, that's going to be 2V. There's one final part in this diagram that I haven't touched on, which is this spring here. And what this does is that once the platform has moved up and pulled the carrier up, this spring will act to bring the carrier back down again. So that as the platform moves down, these springs will be trying to pull this bearing over to the left and this one over to the right, and thus it will pull the carrier downwards. Now, there is a pretty big limitation with this, how I have it right now, which is that the platform can only move straight up. If it moves off at some angle, like over here, then what will happen is that this length will get shorter faster than this length gets shorter. And the ball is, and this carrier is just not gonna move properly. Because as I have it right now, this carrier is always going to be parallel to the platform. I have considered changing this design around a little bit to make it so that the, the carrier can be at an angle relative to the platform, but I think that's just going to complicate things and I'm trying to avoid that for now. I want to try to keep them parallel at all times. So how do I fix that problem of the platform only being able to move straight up? Because at the end of the day, that's not a very good juggling robot if it can only throw a ball straight up and down. It has to be able to move around. The solution I've come up with is to, rather than attaching these cables to the ground like this, I will attach them to motors. What this will mean is that as the platform moves around at funky angles, these motors can twist and untwist to keep this length of cable the same on all sides. This may be a little bit overcomplicated, but it's the best solution I've come up with so far, and I can't see anything inherently wrong with it, so I'm going to see how this how this goes. Now there's one more problem with this design, which is that unless these motors supply power to help pull these cables in to lift the carrier up, the fastest that the carrier can possibly move is double the platform speed. And I've calculated that to throw the ball a meter high, the ball needs to be moving at around 4.3 meters per second when it's released. And that means that the platform would need to be moving at around 2.15 meters per second, which is way faster than I'm expecting it to be able to move. So I need to fix this somehow. And my solution for this is to, rather than have the cable routed straight up and down over this pulley like this, I'm going to swap this pulley for a stepped pulley. That will look a little bit like this. So this green part up here is the platform, this is just the ground. Of course, this is actually going to be connected to a motor, but I'm just drawing it as a ground for now. And the way that this works is the ground or motor cable 
is attached to a small wheel, which is fixed to a larger wheel, and on that larger wheel, a cable is wound that goes off to the carrier, which ultimately is where the ball is being held. So the way that this will work is when this platform moves up, the length of cable through here is going to increase and cause this red pulley to start spinning around. What will happen then is that we'll pull this upper cable in at a faster rate than the platform is moving up as a result of this pulley being stepped like this. This does come at a cost, however, which is that the platform is going to need to push up with quite a bit more force than it otherwise would with just the normal pulley layer. To understand why this happens, we need to have a little bit of a look at one of Newton's laws. If you've studied physics at a high school level, you would remember the equation that F is equal to the mass times acceleration. And this is almost the entirety of this equation. What it is in reality is the sum of forces is equal to the mass times acceleration. So if I have a block with one force pushing this way with one unit of force and another force pushing up here with two units of force, then the block is going to accelerate up in this direction as a result of the sum of forces. So the difference between this one and this one. This is fine for objects in translation, like that block that was just moving in one direction. But here we have a pulley that is rotating. So what we need to do is find the rotational analog of this equation. And what that looks like is the sum of moments is equal to I times alpha. This might look a bit confusing at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So alpha is just angular acceleration in the same way that A is linear acceleration. I, you can think of as just being mass. It's, it's very closely related to mass, but it's not quite exactly mass. And moments are just a force acting at a distance away. So what we can do to actually understand what forces are going on in this system is to draw what's called a free body diagram, where you draw the objects in question as well as whatever forces are acting on them. So here we have the pulley and we have a force from the arm that is pulling this pulley up. We have a force going down to the ground through this cable. So I'm going to call this cable. And we also have the force going down to the ball and that's acting off at some angle. We also need to label in our free body diagrams any relevant dimensions because these dimensions can become quite important as we will see soon. So let's just call the outer radius R2 and the inner radius R1. Now I don't want to go into too much specificity here because we don't know, for example, what this angle is and it doesn't really matter because ultimately we're just trying to see how changing these two radii change what force the arm needs to exert and to see how that is multiplied. So what we need to do is find a relationship between the force going to the ball and the force in the cable because the force that the arm needs to exert is going to be proportional to both of these. If one of these, for example, the force going down to the ground is really, really big, then that means that the force in the arm will need to be at least that big. So we need to know for now, just approximately how big each of these forces are with respect to each other. To solve this, we can use this sum of moments equation. And let's see how that works. So we know that the sum of moments is equal to I times alpha. Now, as I said before, this I, you can think of as roughly being mass. And what this refers to, what this section in here refers to on the right hand side is the motion of the thing that is spinning. And in our case, that thing that's spinning is the pulley. I'm planning on 3D printing this, but even if I don't, that pulley is probably going to be pretty light. So that I value is going to be quite small. And what this means is that we can just ignore this side. So we can say that that's zero since I is small. We can just basically ignore it. In reality, that's going to change the answer a little bit. But to be honest, this I value is going to be very, very, very small. So we can absolutely just ignore it. So what this means is that we have the sum of moments is equal to zero. 
Now, the way that taking moments works is a moment is equal to a force multiplied by the distance away that that force is acting. So if you hold, if you were standing here holding a long stick with a weight on the end, the moment that is exerted on your arm is equal to that force multiplied by the distance away from your hand that it is. What this means is that because there is a distance involved, you have to pick a point to take moments about. And in our case, it makes sense to pick the center point here, this center of rotation, which I'll label point O. So what we have is the sum of moments about point O is equal to zero. So looking at the different forces that are acting on this system, we have three forces, but only two of them will actually come up in this equation because one of them, the force from the arm, is acting directly through this point. That force has zero distance from our point of interest. So this does not create a moment at all. It's not trying to twist the system at all. The other two, however, are. So we have the force of the, well, going down to the ball, multiplied by the distance that it's acting over, which is R2. So that's the distance from this force to the center point. And that is acting in a clockwise direction. So we'll just have that as being positive. It doesn't really matter which direction we pick as long as we're consistent. So that will be positive. And then the other moment is created by this force that goes down to the ground. And that is acting in the opposite direction. So we'll have that as negative. That's causing this wheel to rotate counterclockwise. So that will be F cable times R1. And we know from up here that this is equal to zero. Okay, so what we can see is if we rearrange this equation just a little bit, that F in the cable is equal to F in the ball multiplied by R2 on R1. And keep in mind that R2 is larger than R1. So this means that the force in the cable is going to be larger than the force that is going to the ball in exactly the same proportion as the ratio of the radii. So what we found is that whatever the force going down to the ball is, which has to be some minimum amount to actually get the ball to move, we need to multiply that force by the ratio of the radii of this pulley that I've made, this stepped pulley, and that will tell us the force that is going down to the ground or the motor or whatever I have there. So this means that the force going down to the ground is going to be potentially significantly larger than the force going to the ball. And ultimately what we care about is what the force that the arm needs to exert is. And as we talked about before, that force in the arm needs to be at least the force going down to the ground, plus some component of the force going to the ball. So ultimately, the larger that R2 is with respect to R1, the more force we're going to need to exert in the arm. This creates a trade-off between wanting a really large outer diameter so that lots and lots of cable can get wound up really quickly and thus pull the ball up really fast against needing the platform to exert enormously high forces. So there's going to be a bit of a balancing act between how strong the platform motors are that are pushing that up versus how fast I need the ball to be moving. This sort of analysis is extremely common in mechanical engineering, and I've been doing this sort of math for every system that I've analyzed so far for Jogglebot. I would be pretty keen to show some of this in more detail in later videos. So if you're interested in seeing more of how the math side of things works, then please let me know, because I'll be very keen to show how this works. This stuff can seem very, very intimidating at first, but it's extremely useful to know how to analyze systems in this way. and I want to make that as accessible to people as possible. It's a little bit tricky to get your head around at the very beginning, but it's well worth the effort. So this should give you a pretty decent idea of where I'm going with Jogglebot's hand. This design is a lot more complex, I think, insofar as it keys the motion of the platform with the hand, so they have to move together. And in that regard, it might make things a little bit more difficult to control. However, I do think that that's worth it because it means that, every, that all of the motion will be 
should be perfectly smooth. So as, as long as I can control the, the platform in a smooth manner, which I should be able to, then the hand will also move in a nice smooth manner. I'm really, really interested to see how this goes. This is definitely the most complex thing that I've ever designed. And I'm a little bit nervous, but also excited to put it all together and see how it works. So that's where I'm at with Jugglebot's hand. It's been a very long process to get here and the hand has been definitely the trickiest part to wrap my head around. The arm was relatively straightforward thanks to there being a lot of documentation online about how to make steward platforms, but the hand is my first foray into uncharted territory and it's, it's not easy. It's definitely a little bit tricky. I'm very, very excited to see how this next design works and I'll be sure to update you all with progress of how that's going because it's, it's going to be big. There's a lot of parts that are involved and I've had to do a lot of redesigning to get the design to work. So if that sounds interesting to you and you'd like to see more, then I would love to see you in the next video. Until then.